This was brought to you by The Strange, The Bizarre, The Unusual, I Like It. On YouTube and Facebook. Andrew White. The United States is at war, and it is the year 1849. Andrew White, a known Cross and Bones member, pursued strange and precarious behaviors by first traveling to Europe, asking for support for the Confederate Army. When Andrew White's attempt failed, he returned to the United States and ran for Congress on the Union ticket. Later he was involved in the building of two well-known colleges, Cornell and Syracuse. His partner was Cornell, and he was happy with assisting in building Syracuse, but was unhappy about the name. Cornell wanted to name Syracuse after himself. White convinced him to build another college though, and named it after Cornell. White became president of Cornell, where he built a mansion on its campus to live, and served as a professor in the history department. Andrew White served as ambassador to Germany, researched the feasibility of the annexation of the Dominican Republic, became prime minister of Russia, served as president of the American Peace Delegate at the Hague Peace Conference, and the American Historical Society, from 1884 until 1886. At one time, White's library held the largest collection of literature about architecture in the United States. It was obsessed with the Reformation, witchcraft, and the French Revolution. Andrew White collected any book that he could find on those subjects. He sent his library collaborator and manager all over the world in search of such books. His collaborator and manager's name was George Lincoln Burr. His sole responsibility was to travel abroad in search of literature. Later on, White would also become obsessed with the Mormon Church, which was odd because of his views about religion and science and education. White was the first to institute, and strongly believed in, the study of science without religion. So much, he even wrote on the subject, but it was commonly believed to be only a ploy to promote his schools and encourage students to attend them. During this period, most schools taught liberal arts and religion in college. White lectured on the battlefield of science declaring only negative outcomes came out of past interference from religion in science. He also declared religion as dogmatic theory. Andrew White wrote two volumes titled A History of the Warfare of Science and Theology in Christendom in 1896. An older book was written by John William Draper, 20 years earlier, named History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science in 1874. Creating debate between evolution and creation, most scholars and scientists of the period found White's writings false and untrue. It was thought that he wrote these volumes to gain attention to himself, Syracuse, and Cornell. Considering White's obsession with the occult, Mormon beliefs, and being a member of a hermetic organization, it would be easy to agree with his colleagues. When Andrew White died, he was buried within a tomb on the campus of Cornell. Cornell. On the sarcophagus was placed the symbol of St. George. Looking at modern writing, certain things are apparent. Just because something seems to be false doesn't mean it is false. To get people to see things they usually wouldn't see, feed them misinformation with little gold nuggets to find the real story within the false story. Some things are like puzzle pieces, information to find while looking for clues to the story. The stories of St. George, John Prester, and Merlin, in the King Arthur stories, and before being incorporated into the King Arthur stories. It is said that Roger Bacon and Columbus were fans of John Prester, the stories of Merlin and St. George, an old Christian fable going back to the Roman Empire after it converted to Christianity.
Kings and queens used St. George as a symbol on the medals given with the highest and the noblest esteem of the Holy Roman Empire. Medals are still given to soldiers in the military which symbolize St. George and the Cross and Bone Society. The truth a truce peregrinus de Maricourt. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a debate over the Middle Ages by scientists were discussed. The debate concerned whether science had flourished during the Middle Ages. Pierre Doum wrote a book called The History of Science, fostering the idea that the Church contributed to the advancement of science. There were other scientists who insisted that the Church was a hindrance to science. Old ideas of inductive reasoning seem to be an issue among these debates. Most of what science is today isn't tested with inductive reasoning through experimentation. During the Middle Ages and into the Age of Enlightenment, it was a major part of science. The Truce Peregrinus de Maricourt, during the 13th century, experimented with magnetism which he used to improve the astrolabe and creating the universal astrolabe making navigation of the sea easier for maritime sailors. The Truce Peregrinus de Maricourt was also known for his work with the freely pivoting compass needles, which also made it easier to navigate with dry compasses. The Truce was one of the first scientists who believed in perpetual motion, which could also be referred to as free energy. St. St. George. A long time ago, there was a dragon. This dragon was a menace, causing grief to local villages, and nested by a spring which provided water to them. To dislodge the dragon from the spring, the villagers used sheep as sacrifice to distract the beast. When the dragon devoured the sheep, the villagers would gather water from the spring while the dragon was occupied. As time passed, the villagers ran out of sheep and began using fair maidens instead. The maidens were chosen by lot though, and soon when they drew their lot, the fair princess was chosen. How the king begged for the princess to be spared, but with no avail. The princess was offered as sacrifice, but lo and behold, out of the darkness, and into the light, appeared the brave and courageous St. George. Saving the princess, he slew the dragon, released the villagers from their horrible situation, and restored peace to the kingdom once more. So full of patriotism, they marched off to foreign lands, then returning with post-traumatic stress disorder. Unable to enjoy Independence Day because of the fireworks, and still wanting to go back. Trapped in the military because of psych evaluations, coming home, and unable to find a job in the field the military had trained them in. Failing the psych evaluation means they don't get hired. The military has a good program for their kids, though, so sign them up and keep it in the family. Interested in current events and finding things out. Why are things messed up and not matching what's being portrayed? Concepts are turned upside down as questions are answered, some answers that aren't so pretty. In order to control, evil plots are put into place, what's right and wrong are pushed aside, hidden away. Values are trampled and religions attacked, ideologies stand in the way of progress. The trend of standing in line, while shaming and criticizing those who actually made a difference. Rally around families devising plans in order to steal the children, devouring them for a pound of flesh. Forgotten children, families destroyed, and babies torn from the womb for those who would profit. Separate the flock through vanity, greed, pride, and lust. Shady organizations and groups who are obsessed with human traits, behaviors, attributes, statistics, polls, and surveys. Swaying opinion to bring us into agreement with their point of view, pitting one against another, and rewriting history to establish their facts. Merlin. The king wished to build a great tower on a foundation he felt was strong. With each attempt, the ground would rumble, and the tower would fall. Angered, the king called for his wise men, demanding a solution. The wise men gathered and pondered on the situation, until finally coming up with a solution. Announcing to the king, the foundation of the tower is cursed, and must be blessed with the blood of a fatherless son. Sprinkle the blood upon its foundation, and the tower will no longer fall. The king then asked, where can I find such a boy? One of the wise men then responded, I know of a boy named Merlin whose mother gave birth to him without a father. Hearing this the king commanded, bring me the boy at once. 
the king's men rode in search of young Merlin, finding him, and returning to the king at his tower with Merlin. Not wanting to sacrifice Merlin without telling him why, the king explained, the ground rumbles, and the tower falls because its foundation is cursed. The king then concluded, this is the reason why sacrificing you is necessary. After listening Merlin insisted, my blood will not help you. The king responded in question, what do you mean? This was told to me by the wisest men. Merlin looked at the foundation then responded again, it's not your foundation, nor is it cursed. How so? Asked the king, if it isn't cursed then what could the problem be? Merlin explained, it's not the foundation, nor the tower, but what's underneath that presents the problem. The foundation is built atop of a spring with two dragons within it, each more furious than the other. They stay on separate sides of the spring until they are restless and begin to fight causing the ground to rumble, the foundation to shake, and tower to fall. Stop the dragons from fighting, and the tower will no longer fall. Those buildings were built with pride, weren't they? A battle filled with rage and chaos under those strong foundations. America in its bubble, isolated from troubles of the world until two buildings fell, and the earth rumbled and began to shake. Listening without opinion or comment out of respect, an open mind, and a new way of thinking. It's strange listening to such things. Two enemies were discovered under those foundations, full of hate, and more furious than the other. Fighting a battle, over a rock, that neither had wished to end. Seeing bodies of dead children in Palestine on the news and asking, why did they kill those children? The usual response, those people are trying to steal the promised land of Israel from the Jews, and they are God's chosen people. People. Years go by, and more children die, with the same excuse given each time. Do you know what the greater good means? The world is becoming overpopulated, and for the greater good, people feel the need to sacrifice. What is the greater good, and who should live or die? Statistics, such as the World Health Organization's estimates, determine who will live and die 50 years into the future. Scientists use carbon levels as a tool, attempting to decrease carbon levels, hoping to get levels below what's needed to keep the Earth's population alive. Court systems attempt to dictate what is thought, felt, seen, and said while profiling each and every person who sits silently while it happens. Judges making decisions on behalf of parents without consent. Parents too poor to afford a good lawyer, the court persuades them to sign papers declaring themselves indigent and in need of a public defender. Giving up the right to speak for themselves in a kangaroo court ran by a socialist welfare judge. The judge, public defenders, and prosecuting attorney all make decisions for parents behind closed doors. Claiming that parents gave consent through documentation that was never received or properly explained. Parents go to court because of the threat that their children will be taken away, then sit outside in the hallway talking about how great the day is. Disillusioned and unable to comprehend what is taking place. Language is an evil prostitute that disguises the truth from its slaves, masquerading as a friend, but in reality the fine art of manipulation. Filled with nothing but anger, hostilities, and empty vows and oaths. Prester John. How grand, the adventures of Prester John on his journey to far-off lands. Full of magic, mystery, legendary treasures, and the fountain of youth. Mirrors showing every land upon the earth, but the more land discovered, the more lands would appear, and more the story would change. Stories which inspired Marco Polo, Columbus, Roger Bacon, and many more. Marco Polo traveled to China, Columbus sailed to the Americas, Roger Bacon manipulated light, created rainbows, and dabbled with black powder that explorers would bring back from Asia. All the great things that were going to happen, according to science teachers in school. Science is now portraying an apocalyptic future, with rising sea levels, which will cause major cities to flood by 2050. According to scientists in the 1960s, people today should be able to buy tickets to the moon, Mars should already be colonized, and a ship is supposed to be on its way to Alpha Centauri. Roger Bacon The Mongols took over a lot of Eastern Europe, opening trade routes to the East making travel there easier. 
These stories awaken the imagination, allowing our forefathers to imagine new lands outside of the constraints of their time, and represented bravery, courage, adventure, and exploration. Out of this came more imagination which spread from the 11th century into the 15th, 20th, and 21st centuries as well. It was also said, Francis Bacon, was a reincarnation of many other people before and after his time. He was Samuel, the last judge of the Old Testament, Merlin, Roger Bacon, and Columbus. Francis Bacon, Jesuit priest also, believed in Atlantis, and referred to America as the New Atlantis, and he wrote a book about it. Roger Bacon was a fan of Prester John, and the stories of Merlin, which were written about 100 years hundred years before he was born. Was Francis Bacon a fan of Roger Bacon? And did he believe in Roger Bacon's ideas and beliefs? Are there similarities when comparing the two men? They both believed in inductive reasoning. Roger Bacon was actually one of the first scientists to use inductive reasoning. A process used well after his time. Francis Bacon worshipped inductive reasoning while Roger Bacon may have been able to construct his microscope, telescope, and astrolabe on his own. He experimented with the colors within rainbows, thus harnessing and manipulating light. Roger Bacon researched the calendar and could accurately calculate time and proposed the 365-day year instead of the 360-day year currently used in that region during the period. The church didn't make the change until after Roger Bacon's death, so this isn't a fact. Nor is it a fact that Roger Bacon was arrested before his death. These are all just stories handed down to each generation through time, and no records remain determining if he was arrested for his scientific research. Books with forged signatures suggested that Roger Bacon was involved in alchemy. Those accusations have since been discredited, and it was found that those books had never belonged to Roger Bacon. The name of those books were called of natural and supernatural things of the first tincture and root and the spirit of metals and minerals of the metals or tincture of antimony and a work. Roger Bacon was never credited for the Voynich manuscript, but his name was written within the manuscripts. Rumors said he donated a lot to education and visited, as well as taught, in Paris when he could. Roger Bacon studied Aristotle, optics, astronomy, alchemy, and medicine. He was often compared to other scientists of his period, such as Al-Kindi, Al-Hazen, and Abu Sa'd al-Al-Ibn Saul. Roger Bacon was an exhibitionist, with concern to research, and if he was imprisoned it was thought to be the result of showing off his scientific findings to the public. This may have sealed his fate, but even so, linking this to religion has produced nothing. Abu Sa'd al-Al-Ibn Saul was also imprisoned because of his scientific research, not by anyone of religion, and in prison is where he made his greatest scientific discovery. The Voynich, Voynich Manuscript Centuries after Roger Bacon's death, the Voynich Manuscript was discovered near Rome. When analyzed, the book's origin was determined to have come from northern Italy. As scientists examined the manuscript, they soon discovered that they had found the best coded manuscript of all time. Since then scientists, military codebreakers, and technologies available have not deciphered one page of the manuscript. Members of the Central Intelligence Agency use the Voynich manuscript for practice, to break codes, and are left without results. A link has been suggested between the manuscript, Roger Bacon, and John Dee who was attempting to create a language that wasn't understandable to others, but could be used for speaking to angels, and couldn't be deciphered. Images of plants, women dancing, and half-naked, while holding each other's hands, are portrayed in the Voynich manuscripts. It was also suggested, whoever created the manuscript possessed telescopes and microscopes. Images within the book have close, close resemblances to galaxies and cells, never seen by the naked eye during that period. The Mongols unknowingly contributed to the advancement of science also. New adventures by sea and land opened up new territories territories in the east and the west. Ponce de Leon discovered Florida and searched for the fountain of youth for the remainder of his life. A story he had heard from the adventures of Prester John. 
This was during the same century that Roger Bacon was alive, and a secret society called the Rosicrucian was formed. Their ideologies later formed the same ideas adopted by the Freemasons centuries later. Esoteric belief formed basic ideas and concepts within the Hermetics. The date when the Rosicrucian society first formed is unclear, but the original membership was kept to a small number, and the members had to have backgrounds in medicine. It is believed their society formed in the 15th century though, the same time the Voynich manuscript was written. It was to say that these earlier members of the society didn't have access to microscopes and telescopes, centuries before their invention. Columbus himself read and studied Ptolemy, and many of the people of this period also studied his work. Not only was it the time of the Renaissance, and the time of revolution, but it was also the time of the birth of the Hermetics. The Baconian theory of Shakespeare's authorship. It was believed that Francis Bacon was a member of a secret society called the Rosicrucian. There was also the Baconian theory of Shakespeare's authorship. This theory could hold weight because of the evidence presented about Shakespeare's life and death. Since the 1600s until now, it's been proclaimed that Shakespeare Shakespeare wrote the most elegant and grandest of writings of all time. But did he? During and after Shakespeare's time, there were credible critics who believed Shakespeare had never written his works. Furthermore, the theory claims Shakespeare never even existed. Termed as Baconians, they believed Shakespeare was no other than Francis Bacon, using Shakespeare as a pen name. Stating, the meaning of the name Shakespeare was actually the goddess Athena, wearing her helmet of invisibility, while shaking her spear at the snake of ignorance below her feet. Using her helmet of invisibility to hide from view. Others were also suspected as being the author of the writings. Some have been thought to have written all of Shakespeare's writings themselves, while other claims believed that groups of writers were authors of the literature. These claims make a lot of sense if looked at honestly, and what is presented should clearly bring into question who the true authorship of Shakespeare's writings were. Mark Twain stated, Shakespeare was credited for being the greatest writer of all time, and placed upon a pedestal, where he is now practically worshipped from. He has contributed so much to modern writing that our children are all sent to school and taught the writings of this great man. After Shakespeare's death though, he never gave one manuscript, book, or writings of any kind to his family in his will. Shakespeare never received a letter from one single person. Not even a fan? Not only did he never receive a letter, Shakespeare never sent one. A man with that much prestige, but not one letter sent or received. Received. Within his family, he was apparently the only person who could read and write. Shakespearean supporters even admit that he only had a seventh grade education. Shakespeare, according to popular belief, was taken out of school in the seventh grade because of religious differences between England and the Catholic Church. England expelled the Catholic Church and formed the Church of England. In response the Catholic Church told its English followers it was a sin for their children to go to any Orthodox schools. If Catholics allowed their children to attend, they were sinning against God, according to the Catholic Church. This caused a lot of Catholic children to go without an education during Shakespeare's childhood, and his father was a devout Catholic. After leaving school, Shakespeare learned the family trade of glove making and helping his father with dealings in wool. There were no opportunities evident for Shakespeare concerning his writing skills, which he was credited for. He still appeared in London and began writing grand plays, with such knowledge of the world and no records of Shakespeare ever traveling anywhere. No ledgers, manifests, or letters found saying, hey, guess who is on the ship with us? Shakespeare knew details about France and other countries that he had never traveled to. He wrote about law, and a man of his social class, during that period, knew nothing about law, and never had access to any of the information. Shakespeare could cite the law though, and not one record was found stating that Shakespeare was a lawyer, or held a position involving the law. Another man was suspected as being Shakespeare, other than Francis Bacon. His name was Christopher Marlowe, and both men ran in the same circles. Marlowe was friends with Thomas Walsingham, who was the cousin of an English operative Francis Walsingham. Regarding espionage, Bacon 
was in France with his mentor Amias Paulette, while Marlowe was also in France with his employer and friend Thomas Walsingham. Francis Bacon learned about culture, law, politics, and was groomed into a gentleman and scholar, occasionally delivering diplomatic letters to England from France for Francis Walsingham. Returning from France, Christopher Marlowe was arrested and released shortly afterward, when he was killed by Ingram Frizer in a drunken knife fight. Ingram was a servant of Thomas Walsingham, who was a courtier of Queen Elizabeth, and related to Francis Walsingham, Queen Elizabeth's spymaster. The idea that Shakespeare and Bacon were the same person is hard to conceive. Putting both men's life works side by side, it isn't easy to see how one person could have done all of what these two men had achieved. These two men contributed too much to be the same person. If Shakespeare was a pen name, there had to be more writers involved. From that perspective, more suspects and avenues could be seen. When Shakespeare was popular, there were the university wits, who always criticized Shakespeare, but were known to have collaborated with him. They starred in his plays and became partners in the theaters Shakespeare had purchased, and they performed in. Odd behavior, but speaking of literature societies, let's not forget that Bacon had a group of writers whom he worked and collaborated with too. The two Tudor theory. In the 1920s, a physician named Orville Ward Owen had claimed to find hidden ciphers within Shakespeare's writings. Using a cipher wheel, he combined keywords and phrases from Francis Bacon, Shakespeare, and other writers. Orville Ward Owen had also claimed to find hidden messages within Shakespeare and Bacon's writings. A 1,000 word strip of words and phrases were applied to strips of the canvas, then rolled over the cipher wheel. It was then rolled again with more words and phrases that included writings from Christopher Marlowe, which were highlighted. The findings were then checked by cytologists William and Elizabeth Friedman, who at first believed the theory, but concluded it was invalid. Orville Ward Owen believed Bacon had not only wrote Shakespeare, but also wrote Robert Greene, George Peel, Edmund Spencer, and Robert Burton's writings. He later wrote Sir Francis Bacon's cipher story, finally giving birth to the Prince Tudor theory. The Tudor theory believed Francis Bacon was the illegitimate child of Queen Elizabeth, and Robert Dudley the Earl of Leicester, and father of Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex whom Elizabeth executed because of a rebellion against England. Another man named as being the illegitimate son of Queen Elizabeth was Edward de Vere, claiming that Queen Elizabeth hid the pregnancy and birth to retain the nobility of Virgin Queen. The theory claimed Bacon's father had married Queen Elizabeth in secrecy, and Bacon had written hidden stories under pen names in order to not be connected with them. Orville Ward Owen came to believe hidden messages were in the stories and written with secret ciphers hidden from those who would censor the works. Nothing has been found of any writings, suggesting this to be true. Warren eventually traveled to England and excavated the riverbeds of the River Wye, believing an iron box with Shakespeare's missing manuscripts were locked inside. He felt that this was the answer to the mystery of his theory. Within the box were the original manuscripts of William Shakespeare's early plays. Nothing was found and Warren died bedridden, poor, and discredited because of his belief. Before his death, he recommended that nobody should ever become interested in the subject whatsoever. Owen's assistant, Elizabeth Wells Gallup, developed his theories and his cipher was found by Virginia Fellows in a Detroit warehouse. Virginia Fellows would eventually wear out the Shakespeare Code, which was published in 2006 after her death. Death it would not be expected to find much information on the topic, considering the people who would have known anything probably stayed silent, out of fear for their lives. If Shakespeare did or didn't exist, the conspiracy could have also been an underground network for homosexuals, and a lot of convincing evidence makes this possible. Bacon lost his standing in the English courts and parliament for taking bribes. He was arrested and released after declaring his crimes. It was never a fact that if he didn't declare his crimes of bribery, Bacon would have been charged with boogery instead. The term, closely related to the charge of sodomy, and used commonly against those caught in homosexual activities. Both Francis Bacon, King James, and their sexuality have been brought into question by scholars. It is believed that King James preferred masculine love. 
King James and Bacon at first did not get along, but King James eventually accepted Francis Bacon into his court. King James also frequented plays written by Shakespeare. Much about what was written about history has been distorted quite a bit. Shakespeare, the authorship theory, may not have been an actual fact, but it was also never written down in history. This information isn't learned by most people until later in their life. Only through research and finding the information ourselves do we actually learn about the theory, instead of being taught these things beforehand. We send our children to college to learn, and they are taught Shakespeare, but never educated about the subject just mentioned, nor is it added to any curriculum. Students should know the entire subject they are being taught and graded on. Material which has been questioned by educated, well-known writers and scholars all throughout history. History. Students are also told that Columbus discovered America. The fact that he was also held on charges of genocide and tyranny for torturing natives, while governing the land he discovered was left out of the history books. As Columbus grew old, he also became very religious and his thoughts were apocalyptic. His ideas about sailing west also came from a book called, The Second Book of Esdras, which claimed the world was made up of six parts of land, and one part of water. Columbus is a good example against the idea that Shakespeare existed. Both men came from the lower class of their societies, but Columbus traveled abroad by ship, until finally reaching America. His voyages allowed Columbus to explore and learn astrology, astronomy, literature, languages, and cultures and his journeys were recorded in ledgers and ship manifests. Legal documentation that each maritime sailor had to have in order to work. Shakespeare's To Be or Not To Be uses the Vemic Oath Skull depiction too. Vemic Court, as a result of disputes between warring factions of the period, many criminals would flee from the mandates of law that they were deemed as criminals too. They would travel to areas not ruled by the states they were wanted by for the crimes they they committed. Lynn Thorndike described the process of how Middle-aged Germany had practiced Vemic law. Germany practiced law with Vemic courts, working in the darkness of secret tribunals, where criminals were first termed reprobates. Members of Vemic tribunals worked in secrecy, and if any outsider found out about the tribunal, the sentence was automatic death. The sentence for any crime in Vemic law was death. Members were given passwords, secret handshakes, and signs, so that other members would know that they were members of the society as well. The practice of Vemic law was vital to Germany during the 14th and 15th centuries. The emperor had no other solutions concerning justice at the time. Vemic law flourished for 400 years until it eventually became corrupt, with complaints from the people. Vemic laws handled criminals who were involved with witchcraft, murder, rape, and robbery. If three or more members caught a criminal in the act, the sentence was automatic death. To summon a criminal to court, members would post a summons to a tree or a place where the accused would anonymously find it. To be cleared of the charges criminals had to appear for trial and cleared by oath. If they were members, the criminals could appear in court and take the oath. If they weren't members, they had to be represented by a family member who was a member. The criminal still had to be cleared through oaths, and if that wasn't possible, 23 members of the court had to give their oaths in favor of the accused. If found guilty, the accused was immediately hung by the neck on the nearest tree. An engraving of SSGG was engraved into the tree, showing that the them had done their work. Lynn Thorndike was an excellent writer, and reading his work about the Middle Ages is strongly suggested especially a book entitled, History of Magic and Experimental Science. Secret, Secret Societies of Europe Secret societies during the Renaissance and Middle Ages have been considered by most as myth and folklore. Figments of the imagination, thought up by crazy conspiracy theorists and madmen. The truth though, during and even before the Middle Ages, the church didn't agree with ideas that involved experimentation, especially dissection. 
It was thought evil and a form of witchcraft. In Alexandria, one of the first scientists to contribute to the invention of the accolade was accused of being a witch, and her name was Hypatia. She was dragged into the streets, dismembered, and burned at the stake. Alexandria condoned dissecting during the period. The bodies of their dead were being used for the sake of science. After Hypatia's death, the accolade was related to as being a form of witchcraft for a short time period too. Christians then desecrated the Temple of Luxor, removing and destroying objects representing old Egyptian gods. Replaced Egyptian artifacts with Christian symbols instead. As time went by Christianity went from worshipping a god of love, understanding, and peace, to a god who killed witches, pagans, and heretics. Secret societies were formed and flourished throughout Europe, practicing alchemy, astrology, and hermetic beliefs without the threat of danger. Even when people do concede to the idea that secret societies did exist, the belief is that they only consisted of hermetic groups who were hiding in fear of the church. This is true, but hermetic societies weren't the only secret societies in Europe. The Holy Roman Empire had its own caste system with many secret societies. Knights, citizens of nobility, were all members with their own distinct set of laws and oaths which they lived by. This was brought to you by The Strange, The Bizarre, The Unusual, I Like It. On YouTube and Facebook. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.